The following is a recording of the NGA Subduction Interactive Map and Web Portal Workshop that was held via Zoom on the 7th of December 2022. This workshop was intended to give an introduction to the tools that we have been made available at UCLA and can be used as an instructional video to learn how to use the NGA Subduction Interactive Maps and the NGA Subduction Web Portal for ground motion scaling and download. Okay, Yusuf, I so let's start. Down. Very yep. good. I appreciate that, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, so I give you only two, three minutes about uh, NGS subduction, just to remind uh, uh, our minds and refresh our memories about the uh, project. So the project, uh, I want to appreciate really more than 34 uh, researchers and practitioners who worked uh, uh, on NGS subduction. Obviously, we couldn't do it without uh, their efforts. The project uh, was uh, supported by FM Global Insurance Company, as well as USGS, Caltrans, and Pacific Gas and Electric uh, uh, Company. So the database uh, is the largest database among our all NGA programs. It has over 210,000 records by factor of uh, uh, three or four larger than the other uh, NGA programs that we have. We covered the um, uh, different regions of the world, all subduction, obviously. And then once the, the database was relatively in good shape, then the ground motion modelers got involved. And we have uh, uh, four ground motion models. These are all NGS subduction ground motion models. Three of them are global and regionalized. Uh, I'm not gonna read the names. And one of the ground motion models is Japan is specific because they used only Japanese data, not nothing else. So you see the um, uh, uh, authors of these ground motion models. The status of project is that the project is completed. Reports al have all been uh, published. Uh, multiple uh, earthquake spectra papers uh, have been submitted or are being submitted. Still, there are a couple of them that are being submitted. And as soon as the review process is done, these papers are uh, posted at ER Earthquake Spectra website. And then eventually, once all the papers are in, uh, uh, Earthquake Spectra will publish one issue back to back all these uh, papers, maybe in the next few months. But the online version is already available for the papers that went through the review process. So to, today, uh, Dr. Silvia Mazzoni will present uh, um, uh, uh, multiple uh, implementation of the ground motion database as well as models. Uh, Silvia developed uh, an interactive map, uh, map tools for NGS subduction. She is gonna show it to you. And then more importantly also, uh, NGS sub online tool that you uh, similar to the uh, versions that we had it for NGA West and NGA East. You select the motion, you do some scaling, and then you download uh, the selected uh, motions among 200 plus thousand uh, records. So uh, please enter your uh, comments and questions into the chat, Zoom chat. And then at the end, we will try to answer as many questions as possible live. Otherwise, we are not gonna brush anything under the rug and we collect the questions and you, uh, we are gonna put it in a separate web page uh, for you. So all questions will be answered either live or offline. Thank you everyone, appreciate that. Especially I'd like to thank uh, Sylvia. She has spent a tremendous amount of time on these tools and now we are gonna hear from her. Thank you, everyone. Excellent, okay, thank you. Welcome everyone. I know that uh, we've all been waiting for this web tools to be ready and uh, I appreciate everyone coming in today to um, 
go through the portals that we've developed and um, I, at the end, it will give you a password access so that you can test uh, these tools that yourselves. So the most important thing is we're gonna focus on two things, the interactive maps and the web portal. As uh, Professor Bozorgna already pointed out, this is a large project. It was sponsored by uh, Caltrans, FM Global, Pacific, PGNE, and USGS. And what's great about the contributions is not just financial, but just a lot of technical support that we get uh, from these um, participants in, as researchers, as well as uh, the funding agencies. So in today's workshop, what I like to do is I like to spend just 30 minutes, the first half, in going over the tools themselves. Uh, most of you are already familiar with the NGA West 2 portal, uh, which I developed almost 10 years ago. And what I've done is I've tried to keep the same workflow, made the improvements that I thought were worthwhile. But if you're familiar with that tool, working with this tool is going to be that much easier. Um, so that's what we're going to spend the first half hour on. And then what I like to do is just have a question and answer session in the second half uh, where we can talk about not just not the details of, oh, how do you do this particular item, but really talk about what features you've appreciated in the past, uh, what features we want to see and um, how we can address different general questions from the from the audience. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the project and the data sets and tools that are available. I'm going to show you the interactive maps and then spend a little bit more time than the, on the ground motion record down download portal. Um, going to go through the workflow for the portal, highlight the significant features of that, and really point out what the differences are with the NGA West 2 portal. So I have a there's a lot of products, as it's already been mentioned. The big one that I was mainly involved with was the data. So we have published the flat file. Uh, we've got database tables because the whole data set was stored in a database format, which makes it a lot easier to manage and update records and augment the database. We published a preliminary set of ground motions, and today we're publishing the entire set. Uh, and with that, we've also developed some interactive maps. So these are visualizations of the data. Uh, the four ground motion models have been published and developed. With three of these, uh, I've implemented them into workbooks, especially the Excel file is the one that has the latest versions of it. The other ones don't have the latest version of the, the tool, but the point of that was just to really give you a framework, then then you can update them and implement it into your program, making sure that you're consistent with the published work. Uh, there's also additional intensity measures or um, you know, damping scale factor models been published for the NGA subduction models as well as conditional models for secondary intensity measures. Most importantly, there's a lot of publications. Very, very important. I highly recommend that you look at the publications before you start using these tools so that you have an understanding of which ground motion models are applied for what cases and same with the data sets you know, what, what is the data about? Uh, so everything is explained in the reports and the tools that are developed are based on uh, what is documented. Today, I'm gonna focus on just two of these items, the interactive maps and the download portal. And you can find all this if you go to the www.risksciences.ucla.edu slash NHR3 slash NGA subduction. If you just Google UCLA NGA subduction, you will find directly this link. So it's a little bit wordy, but it's pretty easy to find. This is a screenshot of that web page, and you can see everything is there. Access to every one of those tools is there. I liked it putting everything in one location so that you can really go between the different tools and items that we have available. The flat file is there. The flat file is the complete set of all the intensity measures as well as the metadata for each one of the records that you're downloading. So that's the reference where you would get the data that you need for the records that you're using. Uh, we've got the maps that I will show you. Uh, we've got the Excel and other tools for the ground motion models themselves. We've got the records and most importantly, the documentation. So that's all in this one main web page. And if you want to point your phone to this QR code, you don't have to type everything out. So we'll put those out. So the first thing I want to show you is uh, the interactive maps. This is something that I'd done another project and I thought it was valuable 
to do it with a large data set that we can do this with the NGA subduction. So we've got a dis geographic distribution of stations, epicenters, as well as intensity measures. And I'll show you how those are broken up. If you go to the web page itself, uh, it's just the NGA subduction slash maps. There's a nice, you know, very wordy description of the different things and instructions you can do. Please read that once. I put a lot of time into writing the instructions and I hope they're clear and helpful. So if you go to that page, the very first map that you see is a map of the station locations. So these are all locations that we have. As you can see, we have them all the way from Northern Alaska, all the way South in South America and New Zealand. And we have a variety of different VS-30s. If you click on an individual station, you see what is shown here on the right-hand side. It gives you just some metadata about the station. I didn't want to put too much information. Uh, and then it tells you how many records we're recording, how many recordings are for this station, and then gives you a hyperlink to a visualization of the spectra and the time series themselves. So if you're just trying to look around, you're not you know, doing a, a thorough search of, for uh, you know, ground motion sweep, but you're interested in understanding how uh, NGS subduction works and how subduction data works, I think this is a very useful map uh, to be able to visualize all the data. This, this is a zoom in of what you see for each record. So if you don't need the data digitized, this is a great way of finding individual records and visualizing the three components and the three uh, acceleration, velocity, and displacement. I've shown you the spectra as well as some relevant metadata in this. So we have this for every record and you can access it through the station's data uh, map as well as the epicenter map, which is what the next map is. So this is a map of all the epicenters that we have for the NGA subduction. As you can see, they're all right around the ring of fire here. And now if you click on, and these are color coded by magnitude. So we've got magnitudes ranging from 2.2 all the way to 9.12. Um, I think the highest mag, it's either I don't know, Japan or South America. If you click on one of these epicenters, it's going to give you, again, this is a combination, but here it's broken up, gives you metadata about that event. So here I clicked on Tohoku, and it tells you the number of recordings that we have for that event. And that's why here I couldn't put you know, the same figures as I have for the stations themselves, because it's just way too much information. But what we've done here instead is for each event, we have a map of intensity measures. And so I couldn't make up my mind as to which intensity measure to give you, so we pretty much gave you all of them. Uh, you've got the different components, as well as the resultants in the ROT-D50 and the ROT-D100. And then we've got data for PGA, PGV, and then you know spectral acceleration in the short and longer period range. So if you then click on one of these, it gives you a figure like this. This is a map, it's interactive. You can actually zoom in and see where these recordings are. Uh, and then you can click on each one and it gives you the metadata that I'd shown you in that JPEG file. And I'll show you that. Um, but it's neat because you can see the distribution. So this is all the recordings. This is not the case for all the events. Oftentimes an event may have one or two recordings, uh, but when you've got good data such as Tohoku, I thought this was a good way of being able to visualize the distribution of intensity measures. So on the left-hand side, we've got the PGA, and on the right-hand side, we've got a spectral acceleration at one second, and this is for the ROT-D100 at 5% damping, and again, we have it for the other components as well. You can zoom in and zoom out of these maps. You can play. You can actually measure distances and have a good understanding of maybe certain regions that you're interested in. If you click on one of these, it gives you the same figure that I'd given you before uh, with the stations and the recordings themselves. Uh, and so it gives you a better understanding what is, you know, this purple, um, you know, recording right here. You can zoom in, find out where it is, uh, as well as just visualize metadata and again, the time series and spectra. So this is a great tool if you're interested in a certain earthquake. Uh, or in uh, certain stations. Another way on the page that I've done, instead of if you don't want to go through the maps and you're interested in an individual event, we have you know tables and tables. I've broken them down by region, and then you just scroll down to find the event that you want. I've given you magnitude and year. I think these are the best ways to find the records and the number of recordings. And so just to kind of give you a quick demo of this is. 
So this is what that page looks like. Uh, it uh, You scroll down. This is the first map that I showed you. This is the second map with the epicenters. And then these are the tables that are broken down by region. So what you could do is we pick, let's go to Japan has the most dense recordings, but you see just with my mouse, I can zoom in and out. Um, if you're interested, maybe sometimes I like this map because it shows you where the mountains are. Uh, the, there's also the terrain map. So it's it's a better way of understanding sometimes, especially with the with the stations of what the area looks like. So this is the, just the widest map. So if I zoom in and I find this dark spot, uh, this must be Tohoku because it's the largest magnitude. So I can zoom in and I can click on it. And then I can pick the PGA in the map. It opens up a whole new page. And then I can zoom in and you know do what I want. And oh, let's go to Tokyo, see what's happening in Tokyo. This is great. There's a lot of recordings and I can click on an individual record if I want, and then I can click on another one. So it's a great way of just visualizing the data more than uh, just on certain records, but it's broken down by epicenters as well as by regions. Um, so I think this is going to be a, a very useful tool. And again, if you go to the main page, it's going to take you to this page right here. Um, so this is just a quick overview, but just go in and play. It's it's a lot of fun. And I had fun creating these maps. You learn a lot about subduction events themselves. OK, and so that's the maps. I, I wanted to give you something quick so that you can visualize it. Now, the real reason we're here is the ground motion portal where you can uh, search for records. You can, quote unquote, scale them and download them just like in the NGA West 2. But I know that there were some uh, oftentimes misunderstandings, you're downloading the original unscaled records. But in the process, you look at the data, the output, we give you the recommended scale factors that you can apply to your records. Uh, so this is just a, an overview of the workflow that you would do in using the tool. Uh, you need to set up an account and log in. Again, this is just like the NGA West 2 uh, workflow. Uh, you define a target spectrum. Uh, we've got the four different options as usual where you have no target spectrum. Maybe again, you're looking for individual records and then you're going to be working with them yourself or maybe you're looking for a certain event. Uh, we've got the two period spectrum. This is if you from the relatively old days of giving the spectral acceleration at 0.2 and one seconds, as well as the T sub L, then what we do is we use those points to develop the constant acceleration, velocity, and displacement spectrum. Um, and you can use that as your target spectrum. Then there's a user-defined spectrum where you give a list of periods and spectral acceleration. The input for this, I've changed it from what I had done in the NGA West 2. I like it better because it's just less chances of errors and confusion than just so much time spent in creating the file to upload. So now you paste the values and I will show you that. Uh, this is where you would paste now from USGS, you're given the multi-period spectrum. Uh, now we no longer have to pre-compute uh, the two from the two period spectrum. So this is where you would paste your USGS multi-period spectrum. And then we've got the scenario spectrum, which is where you use the NGA subduction ground motion models that have been implemented in this tool as well. Once you've defined your target spectrum, if you want, you can download it. Maybe you're done. Maybe you could just move on uh, and that's all you needed. So you can download a CSV file that gives you the data, your input as well as the output. The next step would be to define your search criteria. So now we're going into the NGA subduction flat file. You define things such as event, site, path, and record characteristics. Uh, or maybe you're looking for an individual record itself. Uh, you can define it by earthquake ID or station ID. And uh, so that's the search criteria. Then the second part will be scaling. If you're doing scaling, what kind of scaling do you want to do? Um, you can do it on different intensity measures. Uh, you can define what kind of suite average you want. And I'll show you the details of this, the number of records and uh, the type of scaling that you're doing. Once you've defined this scaling criteria and you push the button to go ahead and scale the records or compute the scale factors, now you can visualize your results. Uh, it shows you the records, the mean plus or minus one standard deviations. You can look at individual record components. You can visualize the time series as well as the record metadata. Again, this is similar to what we had in the NGA West 2. 
Then you can download the unscaled records. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different. I've made it a little bit more bot resistant than the previous one. Because we've got such a large data set, I just didn't want the site to get bombarded by large downloads. Uh, so I've added an extra step here, validation. And now you're downloading three different things. One is the usual report with all the input and output for both the target spectrum and the scale factors. And then you're downloading the AT2 files because, and that's the acceleration in rows, uh, because that's typically what a lot of the programs will ask for. It's the most efficient way to store the data other than binary. Uh, and so we still give you the AT2 files. Then we give you another file, which is a .avd is what we called it. It's a CSV file that has, it maintained the header because I think the header is important, but then I've given you time, acceleration, velocity, and displacement all in columns, they're comma separated. So you can upload this into Excel directly and visualize uh, the time series without having to write something that will convert the rows into columns. This is, this was a, highly demanded and I highly recommended that we do this and I, I really like this new format of the files. It makes it easier for me to visualize the records themselves. And then always make sure they review the report and the records, make sure you go back to the flat file, understand and maybe go in and visualize where these records are from uh, and get more information about the records. Uh, the data set is a full data set. So a lot of the ground motion modelers didn't use all the data and all the records. So it's up to the user to make sure that you do quality control on the records that you, themselves because different people have different requirements and different applications. This is what you see when you first enter the portal. Remember, we're giving you recommended scale factors. Make sure you read this at least once. And we still have the limits of 200 records for every two weeks and 400 every month. Uh, we have to do this because this is how we've managed to make these records available to the public. When you log in, this is you, you put in um, you first need to sign up and there's a form and just ask you some general information. And then every time you kind of reset your computer with mine, I don't have to log in every time. Make sure you click remember me. So you only sign up once and then you only need to log in uh, once your session expires, which sometimes can take. Um, it probably never expires. It hasn't expired at my end yet. So um, so this is just an important step that we need to do. Please make sure you put in accurate information so that we can contact you if there's updates. And the more we can show that this is used, the more we can get financial support to expand databases and do more work uh, and being able to pro provide more data to the public. There's here's just screenshots that I've got graphics from the website. Uh, as you can see, it's very similar format. I did have to rewrite everything because now we're in AWS, uh, but the format and the flow works the same. So you can pick the different uh, target spectrum that you want to have uh, when you start the project. Right now, there's a temporary access password that I will give you. This is independent of your personal login password. This is something what I like to do is have the 300 of you <laughs> to be my beta testers initially to make sure that uh, we go through and people get creative and I'm looking for creativity from you to see to make sure that the input and output is robust enough for people that may not read all the instructions uh, or just get in the habit of just pasting the same values different times. Uh, so this is a temporary password that remind me to give it to you at the end. Um, when you start the project, uh, if you start over, sometimes it's best to start over. So I've made sure that at the top, once you've entered the project, you have a way out of just starting the project over. Uh, you've got, this is the first session section where you define the target spectrum. Always, I highly recommend you always start with loading the sample values, okay? It helps you to understand the input format. It will auto-populate everything to make sure that you got the input and everything. And then what you can do is go in and edit just the parts that you need. Um, I highly recommend this because uh, databases are very sensitive to making sure that you put in the correct input. Uh, once you've put in your input, then you can 
go ahead and compute the target spectrum. So this is the example for the two period spectrum. Uh, you put in the three points, the S sub S, S sub one, uh, and the T sub L. Then I go in and at the NGA periods, I interpolate it that it's the, you know, the constant acceleration, velocity, and constant displacement sections based on T sub L. And then this is used as a target spectrum. Press Once you're happy with the input, you press the button and tell it to compute the target spectrum. This is the new thing that I've done um, for the user-defined spectrum. Now you just paste values. So you've got your Excel sheet and you just paste them. As you can see, Excel, typically you're working in columns. Um, here, the required is in rows and they're comma separated, but I did, make it, this is my recommended and the required, but I think even if you paste your columns for the two values, I've tried to make it proof that it will still work. The best way to test it is this will definitely work. Uh, if you wanna try something different, press compute target spectrum. If a plot appears, then you've done it the right way. And this is the same thing as what we had in NGA West here. Uh, but you can, I, I found this just to be much more easy to do than having to download a sample file and then upload uh, your file and then Mac in format is different from PC format. So here you just, you're working in Excel, whatever program you're working in, and then you just paste these values and press compute target spectrum. I've made it a uh, structural geotech and seismologist friendly. So you can plot these in linear log log or semi log X. I'm even allowing you to do semi-log Y, and I've seen that in a paper, but I don't really see an application for that. Uh, but you can change the plots for both the target spectrum and uh, your records. One thing is if you change this or when you're processing this, there's something in the software that I'm using, which is just open source software. Sometimes the plot doesn't fully plot. And so if you reload the page, it will actually plot it properly. I'm working on that, but sometimes on my Mac, it doesn't it doesn't like to always replot everything perfectly, uh, but that's independent of the format that you're doing. So here we go to the scenario spectrum. So this is where you define the input for your ground motion model. On the left hand side, we have a bigger screenshot, and then on the right hand side, I'm focusing on the input. I've broken it up into event data, site data, path data. Uh, there's other because there's the uh, AG20. Alaska and Cascadia adjustment. I think this should be AG22 by now, uh, but that's what it is here. So um, it, it's just a nomenclature. Relative weight of the different ground motion models. As you can see, I've only implemented these three. Uh, you could be putting 0 0.33, 0 0.33, and 0.34, but then you would have to decide who gets the 0.34 or you can just assign one, 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 and then I divide it by three or by the sum of all the weights. So uh, this is how we do it with the relative weight. I did the same thing with the NGA West here. As you can see here, uh, there's also the sigma and the new thing with uh, uncertainty, with uh, epistemic uncertainty. So this is something to look into in the report. As you can see, there is no conditional mean spectrum for the NGA subduction. OK, and so that's not in this scenarios. The sigma here is if you're looking for the 84 percentile. So the default value, I believe, is one. If you're looking for the mean prediction, you set a sigma of uh, zero here. This is just as you've seen before. These are I show you the plot of the resultant, the weighted mean of uh, the median plus one standard deviation. And it, it also shows you the three different ground motion models. Uh, these ground motion models give very different results in some cases. It's very important that you understand and you read the documentation to make sure that you use the ground motion models that apply to your case. And this is just a linear plot because sometimes it's easier to see the differences. For the download, so this is just downloading the target spectrum and it's the same process for the records, I try to make it bot resistant. So once you press download the target spectrum, this goes in and generates a CSV file with the output. Then this window is gonna appear. Make sure that you're reading, you read this at least once, uh, that you acknowledge the program for these data. And then when you see the agree and download, you don't wanna press this button. On the Macs, you can press it, but um, the way to do it is you right mouse on it and you save the save the link as, and then you tell it where to save it on your computer. Um, so I'm hoping that this is going to slow down uh, abuse of the spread of this tool. 
the problem is if there's just too much abuse, then we have to impose these restrictions uh, that legitimate users want to have. Uh, so I'm hoping that this is going to slow things down uh, for those that are trying to download the entire data set, which is not recommended, especially with such a large data set. If you need a larger volume of records, just please get in touch with us and we can see what we can do to collaborate. Once you're done with your target spectrum, uh, you go in and you define your search criteria. So the search and scale input is broken into two parts. The scale, the search criteria is on the top and the scaling for the suite is on the bottom. So this is the input, just like what we gave you for the scenario almost. Uh, this is just searching the database. Therefore, you, you give ranges. If you're looking for a specific value, then make sure you give the range to be very small. Uh, be careful with over or under constraining. If you have too many records results, uh, you're going to be told there's just too many records for me to pre-compute. And so you may need to tighten your search criteria. Uh, this is just some highlights of some of the things. I've, in, I've added a lot more information for your search for even just for the latitude, for the hypocenter and uh, the station. Very important, focusing on the event type, whether you're looking for an interface or an interslab uh, and uh, the different geographic regions as well. And I've put in uh, constraints on duration as well as PGA. So a little bit more constraints than we'd had in the past. Uh, for the scaling criteria, uh, there's a lot more to it because it's, it really depends on the type of scaling that you're doing. And um, once you've input these criteria, then you click here and you do the search the database and compute the scale factors. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit on these different inputs for the search criteria. Um, and so the first one is the resultant or the, you know, for the intensity measure. If you're working with the NGA ground motion models the, for the scenario, those are in the ROT D50. And so your search is limited that you can only look for ROT D50 for, you know, scaling and matching because you don't want to match your ROT D100 to your ROT D50 because the ground motion models were specified as such. If you're looking something else, so for example, if you define your own a spectrum, then you have options to do the matching and scaling on all the different components. So make sure that you're careful about your selection, that your target and spectrum and your search match the same resultant. So that's really important. Uh, the damping right now, the search only has 5% uh, damping anyways, but who knows, someday it may get expanded to more damping ratios. Uh, the sweet average, uh, you can either do it arithmetic or geometric. I know geotechnical engineers like to take the geometric mean of all the records, uh, but the building code has you take the arithmetic mean. And so that's why I have it defaulted to arithmetic, uh, but in case somebody wants to take a geometric mean of the suite. Um, the number of records, uh, you know, I set a limit that you can't, I can't process more than 100 records at a time. Um, and so here, don't be greedy, be careful because you don't want to exceed uh, your downloads limits anyways. And so you may just need to do batches of searches depending on if you're doing interface and interslab anyways. Um, the record scaling, uh, this is for the, for the initial selection, it's based on the MSC, uh, but there's many different options uh, for, the rec for the scaling method itself, and I will show you those. Uh, this is the MSC weight function. If you're not familiar enough, play with it. Um, you, can, th this, you can put more weight into the ends or the center of your periods when you're computing the mean square error when you're selecting the records or even for the scaling itself. Uh, typically, you just give uh, the weights of one and then here you put the period range that you're interested in for, you know, that's defined by your building code. So maybe 0.2 to five and a half seconds. Um, this here, as I was telling you, is just the different scaling options that you have. And I will show you the results of those different scaling options. I've added a ta target spectrum scale factor. Uh, so if you want, you could do uh, a 0.9, because if you're doing amplitude scaling in the ASC7 code, uh, if you, what it's telling you is that you need to be above the target 
but above 90%. And so here you put in 0.9 with the above target and um, making sure everything else fits, you're meeting the requirements of AC722. The initial scale factor is uh, in the selection of the records. I you can define, okay, only give me records that have scale factors between 0.25 and 4, let's say. But remember that there's the additional scale factor on the switch. So maybe your resulting fit scale factor may be 4.7 or even 5 sometimes. Um, but I can't put the constraints afterwards. They have to be put in the search. And so these are the different inputs that you have for your scaling criteria. The next step is you would visualize the records. So we show you uh, the resultant and the mean plus and one plus or minus one standard deviation of the suite itself. Here, this is plotted log log. And then I'm just showing you the different results if you pick different scaling methods. So if you say don't scale them, you still have a target spectrum because you still want you know, spectral shapes that match a certain spectrum shape, uh, but then you don't want them scaled. And so, and, you know, we have this scale factor. So these are the records unscaled. Uh, you can do scaling at, if you're doing a CMS uh, for some reason, then you could scale them in an individual period and the option of the single period scaling po pops up. And so you can specify, you know, here it is, for example, at one second. Uh, so this is if you're doing a CMS. Remember, this matches only on the mean, not the standard deviation. And then we've got uh, the minimizing the MSC, which minimizes the mean square error of the suite with respect to your target spectrum. And then there's the option of above target spectrum, which all it does is it computes the MSC here spectrum, but then it makes sure, and you can kind of see it here, that in the period range that you've specified, does not fall below your target spectrum. And so I'm trying to zoom into here that you could see that this one is above and below because it's minimizing the mean square error. So it's approximately the same, but if you need to be above your target spectrum, it does it for you automatically. And so we put this option directly in. Uh, if you want, if you're happy with your selection, but you want to maybe look at different intensity measures or different scale factor requirements, uh, then you can just say compute the scale factors only and you can reprocess the records uh, based with the same uh, set of records that you had in your search. Uh, so you just need to press this button here. Uh, the last part is you can visualize the record metadata. So initially, all the records that met their criteria, they're all selected, and it gives you information. This table goes very far to the right. I try to put in as relevant metadata as possible. Um, and then if you want, you can select individual ones and recompute the scale factors just for those records. And then you'll see once you press this button here, it shows you the, the suite of just three records. And you can see the scale factors just for three records. And you see that the scale factors change because you want the suite to meet certain requirements. And uh, the way you select them is you press this little button. My animation is out of whack, but um, the other thing that you could do is if you click the view button, you can visualize individual records themselves. So you can visualize the spectra of all the components. Um, I'm working on being able to turn these on and off. Uh, the current configuration doesn't allow me, uh, but I think it's just important to be able to visualize it here. Then you can do what you want when you've downloaded the records. And also you can visualize the time series uh, in the three components and the three quantities, acceleration, velocity, and displacement in the two horizontal and vertical if available. They're not all available for all the records. And then uh, the last part is you download uh, the unscaled records. So it's the same process. You can just download if you've exceeded your limit, uh, maybe, or you don't want to exceed your limits. Maybe you're just interested in downloading the records because you already have them on your computer. You've used them on a previous project. Make sure you give the program time. It says computing, please wait, because what this needs to go, it needs to go to S3, to AWS, grab the records, zip them, process them, not process them, but zip them into a file and prepare the file. So this may take a little bit of time, uh, depending if, you know, how many people are using the service. And then just like before, try to make this bot resistant that you have to right mouse on this link here and then you save the files themselves. Uh, you'll see that you have a zip file that has a 
um, AT2 files and the AVT files that I told you about. You can open these up in Excel and visualize these a lot more easily because you've got time, acceleration, velocity, and displacement. Uh, there's also still the no scaling option. So if you're looking for individual records, you go in, no scaling, you don't see anything about the target spectrum and you just have uh, the scaling options. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you because there is one thing that I've changed in this portal is that I've put everything in one page. In the NGA West 2, we had it set up that you've got a target spectrum and then you go to a second phase and you couldn't really go back. Well, you could go back, but it was a little bit messy. And so what I've done now is um, this is where you enter. And then once you've entered, I wanna show everything all together. You've got the target spectrum here, and then you've got your search and scaling. It's all fits into one page. And so if you want, you can actually visualize what your input was and close it. Um, I made that close just because you don't need to re-see it. But if you wanna edit that and go back, uh, you can do that. If you're doing significant changes, then I would uh, start over. But if you're just trying to iterate on something, I thought it was better to put everything together. Um, and so that's just an overview. This is based on assuming that you're familiar with uh, the previous version of this that I developed a long time ago. I try to be consistent so that I wouldn't have to develop a whole new manual uh, for this. And then I think I'm... <laughs> Done with my quick demo and uh, I'm ready to take answers. I went yeah. a little bit over time, but I think we're good. Um, I think Great. we've got- Thank you, Sylvia. I appreciate that. The major efforts uh, went through this way, uh, Sylvia, and we really thank her for efforts. There are a bunch of questions. Uh, so let's uh, start, Sylvia, uh, you, uh, you have the list you want to- okay. uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go in chronological order. Uh, Salam, if you would like to just introduce yourself, but otherwise, yes, I've made this recording and I will. we will have this public because this is the documentation on how to use this tool. It's, I think it's the video is better than trying to do screenshot. Well, the screenshots and the PDF will also be available. Um, so yes, this will be available in the public. Uh, Andrew, would you like to ask your question? Or I can read it. Andrew McDizzy is asking, are there any plans to include evolutionary individual intensity measures like Aries intensity or CAV for these? Oh, interactive maps. Um, yeah, that'd be cool. It'd be, I, I think if I have the data, we can generate these maps. I mean, this is something that now, um, if we can get additional funding by uh, great funding agencies out there, then yes, we can do this is if yeah. we have the data then we can map it can, can you hear me like yeah. i was struggling yeah that that was geared towards well initially the interactive maps because that's what you um kind of presented first but i guess that general question kind of applies to just you know the the flat files potentially if like you see an update in the future if um to include you know mostly cav or, or areas intensity um, or on the like tool itself. But yeah, I, I definitely understand that it kind of is contingent on getting additional funding for it. Yeah. So uh, I think once you've done, typically people do a search and selection based on just the, the regular uh, seismogenic information or you know the, the basic fundamentals. And then my recommendation is do a general search and then you can go to any of these flat files and do more advanced uh, searches. I'm not sure what we have published, uh, and but we're working on these additional intensity measures for the NGA subduction as well. Um, I think we're working yeah, that with thanks. John. Thank you. Um, Serene Majalawe, would you like to ask your question? Yes, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my question was, uh, how how is the filtering uh, did you filter the ground motion, especially for Japan? Because I know the original seismo um, ground motion did, are not filtered. So did you do any filtering or ba base base correction for this ground motion? And is it the filtering the same as the NJA East and NJA West? Um, and I have another question. Uh, can we search using the duration, the significant duration, uh, DS9575 in the porter? 
on the portal or not. Thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. So I, I can let Yusuf go into more details, but yes, we followed the NGA protocol for processing and that's the value of these records. I mean, it's very easy to download these records. I mean, that's what we did is we obtained, you know, published records and we've done the additional processing that is the consistent method that is the NGA method. Uh, that method is always evolving. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same as what was down for NGA OS 2. My take is it's it's evolving and we're improving and we're learning a lot more, especially with such a large data set. But the protocol is the same. Um, and yes, we've done the baseline correction uh, for these records as well. So there's always, you can always access the raw data elsewhere, but these are the NGA stamp of approval that we have. And yes, and I've added the search for the 595 duration. Um, I, I could add the 575 that's in the flat file as well, but I figured this was enough for a search uh, criterion. Yusuf, would you like yes, to add something? Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, the protocol is our uh, NGA protocol for a uh, long time ago. So it's consistent. Japanese data, non-Japanese data, everything consistent. And as Sylvia said, downloading the raw data is not a big deal, but tremendous efforts went through one by one each component to filter it according to our criteria, which is really iterative. So Japanese and non-Japanese, they're all uh, processed uh, in a consistent manner. I think what the next question is is along the same lines. Uh, Ryuichi, would you like to ask the question yourself? Yeah, thank you for your explanation. And uh, my name is Ryuichi Tanaka from Japan. So my question is, uh, the magnitude indicated is uh, same, uh, same magnitude, you know, I mean, MJ, there are many kind of magnitudes all over the world, MJ or MW or something like that. So this is the point. Oh, I, I read a different question from that, but... Um, uh, sorry. Yeah, so go ahead. Um, so, oh. and, and great, John. I think John Stewart is here to answer that. My quick question is the flat file has all of them. Uh, and I believe this is the main magnitude that I selected. Um, I guess I should be specific as to which one I use. Magnitude is moment magnitude and is consistent yeah. all over the uh, record. Is that the question? Yeah. I think that's the question. The magnitude is a um, moment magnitude for all events. Mm -hmm. So we, right. we provide moment magnitude for every earthquake. Um, when there are moment magnitudes provided by the global CMT, we prefer that one. Um, if we don't have a global CMT moment magnitude, we then go to local uh, agencies that may provide that information. If we don't have that either, so in other words, there is no moment magnitude anywhere, then we have certain protocols for taking other magnitude scales and converting it. And uh, the details of those protocols are in the Contreras et al. paper that describes the source and path metadata. That Thank paper you. also describes why we have the order that I just described. Why do we have global CMT first, for example? There's a whole paper dedicated to the event data that's in the flat file. So um, as I said, read, make sure you read uh, the papers. Thank you, John, for adding that on. Um, there's also the question here on whether the velocity and displacement time history waveforms, uh, they're filtered in any way. I believe the NGA processing method looks at everything, acceleration, velocity, and displacement. There's different criteria. They also look at, um, and this is just from my own experience in, in being in these meetings, they look at uh, the different frequencies uh, in these different metrics. And then they're just computed by integration, uh, but they are part of the whole, you know, processing, not just the filtering, but the processing process. And they can download it, obviously. Yeah. And so 
I don't give you the AT2 and VT2 files anymore, but you can get them from the complete AVD file itself. Otherwise, it just becomes too much data in, in your download. Um, As Sylvia said, the new ad time, acceleration, velocity, displacement is very useful, especially in classes and uh, educational that you want to ask the students to download their records and plot them and so on. They don't have to write a record, which is a new feature, new type that Sylvia is providing. Yeah. And to follow up on that, there's a question as to whether we want to update, there's plans to update the NGA West 2 and East databases to a singer, similar format. I don't quite have access to those portals anymore. Um, I have generated them. And, and so as NGA West 3 comes, down the pipeline, we will do the same processing, but I don't know if we can come back um, and do that with those. Um, no, 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 the current plan, especially with the funding uh, agencies, unless we get more funding. Uh, as you know how it works, the greatest ideas really, we cannot do it without funding. So if we get funding, we can do that, but not no plan for the time. Yep. And then I'm gonna scroll down. Ah, um, there's a question as to, is there any plan to include the simulated N9 records into the search database? Um, I think that's that's an interesting, we haven't looked at this because this is the NGA subduction database itself, um, but I think it would be great to be able to interact with other databases. You know, that's a different data set, so, um, that's something to think about. And again, it depends on, you know, if there's funding to do that and if people see value in it um, and they can provide funding, then we could do anything. Uh, it's just programming. So, um, And then there's a question here. Could you kindly explain in, on collaboration for working on time histories for research? Um, because Sylvia, you mentioned that if they need yeah. a large set, yeah, so uh, what we've done in the past is uh, we have the records on, you know, I have the records on my computer. And so there's certain processing uh, that uh, I've done for some research projects, but it's a little bit, you know, shaky grounds because um, because of the publications that come out of that um, and the validation of the scripts that we're running. Uh, and so that really needs to be handled on a case by case basis. And, and then, Sylvia, any... the other question is that uh, you have five, uh, 595 uh, duration if uh, uh, we could add uh, 5 to 75 or other duration. Yeah, sorry, I, I answered it when Serena asked it in person uh, that, yes, right now I've got the 595 duration option. Um, and I figured, well, you know, these are requirements anyways. But yes, I can add the 575. The, the more input I put in, the more um, explanation that needs to be given. But I think in the output, I give both quantities. So, you know, a lot of this is you do the search, initial searches. And then if you want to do advanced searches, there's always the flat file that has all the data and there's published data to do additional searches. Um, but yes, I can I can put that in here. That's a good idea. So I if I put it in my notes, I will add that in the search criteria as well. Um, so thank you. That's a great suggestion. Uh, there is got, another question about yeah. the uh, pulse uh, uh, ground motions and identification of pulse like NGFS2. Um, so these are NGA subduction records that are typically recorded very far. Um, and so there is, there haven't been studies done on whether there's pulses in the NGA subduction records. Um, and therefore there is no flag in the flat file as to whether it's a pulse. Those are typically managed as, you know, near field records and subduction earthquakes aren't quite the same type of mechanism. Um, I don't know if John or Yusa has a little bit more information. Yeah, I have not done that yeah. classification for subduction. That's something we discussed it internally, but so far we haven't done. Then, uh, Silva, there is another question that, uh, what about the Fourier spectra? 
Oh, have we computed? I think we computed them. We computed Fourier spectra. So you know how it works. Yeah. Since 20 years ago, literally 20 years ago, Professor Edris is here. We started this game 20 years ago. Uh, so we provide anything that we have used for any modeling. So we have computed Fourier spectra for everything. But since we haven't uh, um, uh, done that, uh, uh, any modeling so far, uh, can you hear me, Sylvia? Yeah. OK. Uh, if there is a demand, we are going to post it. That's my uh, final answer. Is we have it, uh, but we have not posted. But if there is a serious demand, we are going to make it available to public. It's not, nothing is uh, hidden or uh, confidential. There's there's a lot of data and, and different processing and maintenance and curation and making this data accessible is very time consuming and expensive. And so we're doing our best to put as much information out as as we can. Uh, but building this infrastructure is quite expensive in, in just the maintenance of it. And so we haven't quite gotten to these additional intensity measures yet. So. Very good. Uh, so we have on two, two, three uh, minutes. Uh, is there any other comments or questions? We got lots of really kind comments by several of you, and we really appreciate because there's no one is making any money or anything like that uh, in this process. It's all about really uh, moral support, and we really appreciate uh, your kind comments. Anything else? Again, the I have specific. One. Yes, yes. Uh, five seconds. If there is any specific question that I tried this button, didn't work, and so on, send separate email uh, to us, and Sylvia will communicate with you directly. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have one question. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to ask if you, uh, for the Japanese record, if you use the borehole or the surface records in your analysis, because each record in, in the Japanese have like six components. Uh, do you remember which components you have used? Mainly uh, it's the surface. If we have more hole, really, is for information, but that was not the focus of our research. Uh, only surface, uh, because the researchers and others will dig into the more hole data and so on. But that was not the focus of our uh, research. So and, don't count that we have complete more hole data on this data set. Don't count on that. That was not the focus yeah and go Thank look you. a lot of there's a lot of a lot of additional information in the flat file that is wasn't really part of the tool here but there's there's information about the depth of the instrument and things like this so i recommend if you have specific questions about what kind of data is available the flat file was published about a year ago and so look at the flat file look at the report and the papers associated with it and it will talk about the different types of data that we have available in the flat file. So, Silvia, before we leave, there are a couple of uh, people asking for the password that you promised. Okay, so the password is 1970. So, 1970. Um, 1970. So, it's 1970. So, that is the temporary password that is there. Um, Big test is is if everybody floods the uh, server. <laughs> I, I hope it can handle uh, the large number of individuals that we have. Um, but yes, and and that's a good point. I'm going to add my email at the bottom, and I think it's there. Um, but if you have issues and things, can you please email me at smazzoni at ucla.edu? Uh, if you can replicate, uh, send me screenshots of the input and output and be as specific as you can about what you're seeing, uh, I would appreciate it because then I can try to replicate uh, what you're seeing. It works for me, it works for me well, but I think now it's really the test of having a large volume of different people um, being able to try this and, and input things differently. So if you have any questions or uh, you run into issues and inconsistencies, uh, please email me directly. Um, I would appreciate it because this is still a work in progress. So you're running out of time. Yep. A few things. First of all, as Silvia said, if you have any comments, questions, specifically doesn't work some uh, feature and so on, please let Silvia know. That's one. Secondly, 
I truly appreciate Silvia's effort over the last many months to put together all these pieces, huge amount of data. But lastly, this was and is, is a community-based project. So 34 people worked on different pieces of this, and we really appreciate that. No individual um, uh, worked alone. So we really appreciate everyone. And thank you very much, uh, uh, all of you. Let's uh, stay in touch. And uh, again, we thank so much, Sylvia, for all her efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.